All right, today I want to talk about a topic that I get a lot of questions on. I've had this emailed to me quite a few times. People say, what do you think about marriage, divorce, and remarriage? Somebody that's divorced, are they, is, it, is there such a thing as scriptural grounds for divorce? So that's what we're going to talk about today. Now, what was the first marriage in the Bible? This should be fairly obvious unless you're just like totally newly saved and you don't know. The first marriage in the Bible would have been the first man and woman that were created. Obviously, they were married. So let's look at that. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. Very beginning of your Bible. Genesis 2, verse 18 through 25. We're going to see some interesting things here. The purpose of marriage is going to be listed. Okay, Genesis 2, 18 says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. What was the purpose of God creating Eve? So she could help Adam. Verse 19. And out of the ground of the Lord God, and out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air, and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle, and to the fowl of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found an help meet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs, and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh." And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Which, by the way, is really the only time that you shouldn't be ashamed you know, for not having your clothes on. Okay, A husband and a wife can come together and they can be naked and not have any shame therein. But when you have a couple that comes together and they're naked, there should be some shame there. They're not meant to be naked unless it's within the confines of biblical marriage. And that's what we're going to talk about here, the first part of this message. What is biblical marriage? How is it defined? Okay. But you see there, a man leaves father and mother and he cleaves unto his wife. They become one flesh. So, were Adam and Eve married? Yes. He said, she is his wife. You know, he, he called Eve my wife. There. Okay. Verse 24, he says about it's his wife. All right, now what was the second marriage? Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. It says here, And Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And we're not going to read the whole chapter, but it goes on there that Cain kills Abel. And God basically puts a curse upon Cain, and Cain is running then from people. Okay, look down at verse 16, Genesis 4, 16. And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Enoch, and he built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. Now, a lot of people here, you know, they get all excited because they think they find a contradiction in the King James. They say, if Adam and Eve were the first man and woman, then where did Cain get his wife? See, you know, and the, and the thought there is that there would be other people, you know, that evolved from monkeys or something like this, some foolish stupidity. Uh, no. You see, there in the very first part of the creation, they were marrying sisters or cousins. You say... Oh, that's bad. That would create inbreeding and you know problems and stuff like that. Well, not if you go back to when the genetic code would have been a lot more pure. There at the first creation, all right. You make copies of copies of copies of copies, and you intermarry within the kindreds that are mentioned in the Bible. You're losing genetic quality each time. Anybody knows that if you want to create a thoroughbred racehorse, you are very selective with the breeding. Okay. And if you want the purest bred horse, you go back to the original, okay? So back then, breeding, inbreeding between family members or cousins 
would not have been as big of a problem. Now you do it, yeah, genetic problems, all kinds of genetic problems. Back then, not a real big deal. Not to mention the fact that the law against marrying, intermarrying within family, was not given until Leviticus 18. Talking about uncovering your sister's nakedness and uncovering, you know, different members of your family, uncovering their nakedness. And, you know, if you remember there in Genesis chapter 2, Adam and Eve were naked and they weren't ashamed. See? And that's a proper relationship between a husband and a wife. But in Leviticus 18, it says you're not supposed to do that anymore with sister or your aunt or, you know, and it goes down through unless you can read that some other time. So at that point in time, Cain could have either married a sister or a cousin, you know, and no problem, you know, not a, not a big issue there if you understand the Bible. But the point is there, that's the second marriage in the Bible. Now, what was marriage up to that point? Did you see any kind of a uh, uh, ceremony? Um, Cain and his wife went to a local church and they, she wore a white dress and they, you know, they played here comes the bride. You know, did you see anything like that? No. What was marriage at that point in time? Well, it was flesh joining flesh. All right. Two people coming together and joining themselves and producing offspring. All right. Not, let's just come together for a one night fling and then well, I'll see you at the bar maybe some other week or something and we'll say hi or uh-uh. No, no. It's two people coming together, joining flesh and flesh, with a commitment to live as husband and wife. All right? That's very important because the Bible does not advocate whoremongering or fornication. Whoremongering is some two people that live together and are continually, perpetually committing fornication. The Bible does not support that. Okay, so don't try to teach that. It doesn't. But now... I want to show you another example of this. Genesis chapter 24. The thing of flesh joining flesh without any kind of a ceremony. But it's an understood flesh is joining flesh here for the purpose of living together as husband and wife. I'll show you another example of this. Genesis 24 verse 61. Okay. Okay. It says here, And Rebekah arose and her damsels, and they rode upon the camels and followed the man. And the servant took Rebekah and went his way. And Isaac came from the way of the well La Hiroi, if I said that wrong, for he dwelt in the south country. And Isaac went out to meditate in the field at eventide, and he lifted up his eyes and saw, and behold, the camels were coming. And Rebekah lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she lighted off the camel. For she had said unto the servant, What man is this that walketh in the field to meet us? And the servant had said, It is my master. Therefore she took a veil and covered herself. And the servant told Isaac all things that, had, that he had done. And Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent and took Rebekah, and she became his wife. And he loved her, and Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. So you see there a veil, which is interesting. She put a veil upon her, her face there, um, well it says she took it and covered herself there in verse 65, but I would assume that that means she you know, didn't take this huge you know, veil and cover her whole body, you know, it was probably just that she covered her face, which is still carried on in modern day marriage ceremonies. Interesting. But you see there again, you don't see them coming before a ordained pastor or something and going through the ceremony and, you know, Isaac, do you now take this woman to be your lawfully wedded, you know, wife and blah, blah, blah. You don't see it. No exchanging of vows, no official ceremony. You know, she wasn't wearing a white gown and things. So that's not there at this point in time. And you say, well, you know, I don't know about this thing of, you know, just consummation of the marriage, you know, and uh, being... Uh, you know, sexual intimacy. I'll try to say that as uh, gently as I can. And, you know, is that really a teaching of Scripture? Well, Hebrews 13, verse 4 says, Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. The marriage bed is undefiled. It, you don't have to be, there should be no shame there between a husband and a wife seeing each other naked. That's fine. It's ordained of God. But 
the rest of Hebrews 13.4 says, But whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. So if you're just living together in fornication with no desire to really live permanently as husband and wife, and just kind of like, well, we'll live together and enjoy each other until I get sick of her, or she gets sick of me, whatever, and then we'll just, you know, split up. Well, you're going to be judged by that. And if you are living in adultery, in the sense of you are married, legally married in God's sight to somebody else, and you leave them and you join yourself to someone else and you're living with them, well, then you're an adulterer. And God will judge you for that, too. But, um, you know, this argument then comes up, which I've heard from people and, and I've addressed it already, and that is, so then the thing that constitutes a biblical marriage is sexual intimacy. Not quite. Uh, Exodus chapter 21 Exodus 21. Exodus 21, we're going to start at verse 7. Okay, it says here, And if a man sell his daughter to be a maidservant, she shall not go out as the maid men's servants do. If she please not her master who hath betrothed her to himself, then shall he let her be redeemed. To sell her unto a strange nation he shall have no power, seeing he hath dealt deceitfully with her. And if he have betrothed her unto his son, and he shall deal with her after the manner of daughters. Let me just stop there for a minute. So then a betrothal here according to this scripture is sort of a legally binding thing. If a man takes the, ma the maidservant and he says, I'm going to betroth her to myself, and then he turns around and he says, actually, on second thought, no. That's a sin on the man's part. And if he betroths her to one of his sons and then changes his mind, again, he's sinning. So a betrothal in the Bible is not quite the same as a modern-day engagement that most people do. But we'll continue here. Verse 10. If he took, if he take him another wife, her food, her raiment, and her duty of marriage shall he not diminish. And if he do not these, through, these three unto her, then shall she go out free without money. Okay? So you see there are two very important words. Betrothed and marriage. Alright? Now, is it just physical union? No. There's something more to it than just a physical flesh joining flesh and that constitutes a marriage. No, there's a, an agreement that's made there that has legal bindings to it. All right, Even before they get married, officially married as husband and wife, if he's betrothed to her and he says, and he starts doing things that are wrong, he can get in trouble with that. And if he's married to her, that's even worse. But we're going to see that as we continue in this study. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 22. Turn over there next. Deuteronomy 22, verse 23. Twenty-three through twenty-nine is what we're going to be reading. Okay, if a damsel that is a virgin be betrothed unto an husband, and a man find her in the city and lie with her, then ye shall bring them both out unto the gate of that city, and ye shall stone them with stones that they die, the damsel, because she cried not, um, being in the city, and the man, because he hath humbled his neighbor's wife. Hmm. Interesting. So thou shalt put away evil from among you. Let me just stop there for a minute. Notice this woman, this damsel, is betrothed, and yet she's called a man's wife. Even before they're married, the fact that she's betrothed already means she's a man's wife. You don't mess with her. You don't say, 
oh, she's just engaged right now, so I still have a chance. I can still get to her and maybe win her over to me and cause her marriage to be put off because, you know, or, or she's engaged, but she still has time to think it over. Uh-uh. No. Not according to the Bible. Betrothal is the same as marriage. You just haven't gone to the full, the full act yet, which we're going to get into as we continue in this study. Um, verse 25. But if a man find a betrothed damsel in the field, and the man force her and lie with her, then the man only that lay with her shall die. But unto the damsel thou shalt do nothing. There is in the damsel no sin worthy of death. For as when a man riseth against his neighbor and slayeth him, even so is this matter. For he found her in the field, and the betrothed, betrothed damsel cried, and there was none to save her. So you have in the city there where she could have called out for help if she keeps her mouth shut. Then that proves that she was kind of for what was going on. But if she'd cry out, well then she's innocent. But no matter what happens, if a man takes a woman that's betrothed out in the field, you know, she's out walking around a place like this, and all of a sudden a guy jumps out of the weeds and gets her and rapes her, essentially. The guy gets put to death, and there's nothing that happens to her. Because if she cries out at a place like this, there aren't too many people that are going to hear her. Verse 28, if a, if a man find a damsel that is a virgin which is not betrothed, and lay hold on her and lie with her, and they be found, then the man that lay with her shall give unto the damsel's father fifty shekels of silver, and she shall be his wife. Because he hath humbled her, he may not put her away all his days. So you see the precedent there for marriage. And there have been situations where two young people get together. I know of a couple of them that I've heard of. They get together, they have fornication, and a child is produced. And they say, now you're going to get married. The parents, you know, take them together and say, okay, you took the responsibility to commit fornication. Now you have a child that's been produced by this relationship. You're going to go to the next step and you're going to get married. I know of a couple married couples uh, that I've known through my life that that was the case. Okay, doesn't always happen that way, but I do know of a few that that has happened in that manner. All right, now the guy didn't force you know, her or whatever, but you see if he did, here according to the Old Testament law, if a man comes to a young virgin and she's not betrothed, see, and he forces himself upon her, now he has to take the responsibility to be her wife, or to be her husband, excuse me, you know, why? Well, because that's a very serious thing, flesh joining flesh. So you see the thing there, the aspect of biblical marriage being flesh joining flesh, but there's also a legal precedent there of betrothal. If she's betrothed and he does that, he gets killed. No matter, you know, both situations there, if he, you know, rapes a woman, you know, that's betrothed in the city, he dies. If a man rapes a woman out here in a country setting or in the field, he still dies. But if she's not betrothed, then he just has to take her to be his wife. So flesh joining flesh does not, is not the only issue there. Okay, there's a legal aspect there of betrothal. So, very interesting. Webster's 1828 Dictionary, by the way, has a, another word in it, which we're going to be looking at here, called espoused. Now, if you know your Bible, you probably know where I'm going to be going with this. But espoused, here's the definition. Betrothed. Affianced. I'm not sure if I pronounced that right. Promised in marriage by contract, married, united, intimately embraced. So the very first word there in the definition, Webster's 1828 Dictionary, the definition for espoused is betrothed. Turn to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. Matthew 1, verse 18. It says here, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, 
whenas his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph. So you see there, espoused, remember the dictionary definition, espoused is, is the same thing as betrothed. Um, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. So she's espoused, betrothed, but they didn't come together physically yet. And she's found with child. See, what was the Old Testament law? See, let's continue here. Verse 19, then Joseph, her husband, notice it calls him her husband, and they're just betrothed, they're espoused. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. Well, why didn't he just go and say, hey, you know, I found out that you're, you know, with child here. I mean, I'm not the father. I, I know that for sure. You know, I'm breaking up with you. Uh-uh. There was a legal aspect there. He was going to put her away. He didn't want to, you know, do it publicly. He was going to try to do it in private, but he wanted to, he was going to put her away. There's a legal aspect. Verse, excuse me, verse 20. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife. For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. So in other words, can a man call a woman his wife before they physically have been together? Yeah, you just read it. Can a woman call a man her husband before they have physically been together? Yeah, yeah. So what's the instruction here for you as a Christian? You better be real careful before you tell somebody, ask somebody to be your wife if you're a man. And ladies, you better be very careful before you say yes to a man. Marriage is a very serious thing in the Lord's sight. Very serious. And people, you know, in a lot more in the past, they took marriage as a very serious thing and divorce is a very serious sin. And divorce is a very serious sin. Do not be deceived into thinking that it's not. It is. We're going to talk about that as we continue. Turn the page here in my notes. Turn next to marriage, or yeah, marriage. Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22. We're going to look at some different marriages here in your New Testament. The book's called the New Testament. Matthew 22 is actually doctrinally in the Old Testament. See Hebrews chapter 9 if you don't believe me. Matthew chapter 22, verse 1 through 14. And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son. Hmm. So we've seen earlier that there was a veil with Rachel and Isaac, and uh, or was it was it Rebecca and Isaac? Um, boy, I can't think now. But the, you know, we saw earlier that there was that veil that was there, and now we see the thing of a parent making a marriage for their son. You know, it's a parable, but you know, it, it teaches something. It's instruction. Verse three and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. Again he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready, come unto the marriage. But they made, it, made light of it, and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants, and entreated them spitefully, and slew them. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth, and he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Wasn't too happy that they didn't come to the, the wedding for his son. 
It's a very dishonorable thing to do. You know, when you have somebody and they're getting married and you have, you know, people invited to the wedding and they say, oh, no, you know, we just, whatever, we got better things to do. That's a great dishonor. Still that way today. Um, verse 8, Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways, and gathered together as all as many as they found, both bad and good. And the wedding was furnished with guests. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. That's also very interesting. And he saith unto him, Friend, how, come, how camest thou in hither, not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. Now that is a parable of the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is a millennial is the millennial kingdom which Jesus Christ is going to set up. Now in context here, I believe that this marriage supper of the Lamb, a lot of people say it will happen in heaven, but you look at it, how could a man sneak into there without a wedding garment on? It seems kind of strange. I believe actually that the marriage supper of the Lamb is going to be down here on the earth when Jesus Christ comes back at the second coming. After the battle of Armageddon and he sets up his throne and the judgment is done, Marriage Supper of the Lamb. It's kind of interesting because it's like the modern day wedding ceremony a lot of times. You have the marriage ceremony, which I believe is going to be in heaven. We're going to see that in a minute. But then you drive someplace for the reception. Well, we're not going to be driving, you know, but we're going to be riding on horseback. And, you know, we're going to get to come down and, and the Lord's going to kind of show off for his bride. You know, and he's going to say, see that 200 million man army down there, honey? You know, and all the saints will say, mm-hmm. And he'll say, check this out. <laughs> Wipe them out. And we're we'll going to have a big party and we'll be here for a thousand years. It's going to be good. And Jesus doesn't go back up, by the way, for you post-millennialists out there or amillennialists that are trying to get out of the thing, you know. Yeah, right. It's pre-millennial. The Bible's very clear. But, uh, Look at verse 29 and 30 there in Matthew chapter 22. Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God, for in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. So there will be no physical marriage in heaven, but there will be a spiritual marriage, which we're going to talk about here as we continue. I just want to look up something here real quick. It's bugging me now. Rebecca. Okay, it's Rebecca. Genesis chapter 24. I have to apologize. I was in working on the computer all day and, and I looked at the weather and it's supposed to rain from now till Sunday. So I'm thinking got to do the the sermon I wasn't really prepared all that great for it my brain's in shutdown mode after being on the computer for many many hours so sorry I'm not that biblically illiterate okay you know Rebecca and Isaac not Rachel I don't know why I even said Rachel <laughs> sorry about that I just wanted to correct myself there before I continue I know some of you are probably really shocked that I made a mistake out there, you know, because I'm just so perfect most of the time. So polished, you know, here in my multi-million dollar church building, you know, uh-huh. <laughs> Couldn't help but take a little opportunity there to kick church buildings again. Matthew chapter 25. Matthew 25, verses 1 through 13. We're going to see another thing here in regards to this marriage supper of the Lamb that's coming. Matthew 25, Then shall the kingdom of heaven, what's that again? The physical millennial kingdom. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Okay, I'm not going to bother reading the rest of the verses. You can read down through there to verse 13. 
you know, some of them are wise, some are foolish and, and all that stuff. But the point is, it's a parable of the kingdom of heaven. Okay? So it's about the millennial kingdom. And it says that they went out to meet the bridegroom. You see, Jesus Christ marries a chaste virgin, which is the church. And if you're saved, that's you right now. Okay, but towards that end of that time of Jacob's trouble, those Jews that are going to be left, you know, are actually going to be looking for Jesus Christ to come back. And you can read about that in Matthew chapter 24 towards the end there, you know, that they're supposed to be ready, they're supposed to watch, you know, for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's what's going on there. That is not a parable for some Christians that have the Holy Spirit, the oil, you know, and others that don't. That's nonsense. Because you can't have Christians go out and buy the Holy Spirit. You know, you can't say, hey, you don't have oil for your lamp, go buy it. You know, your, your Holy Spirit lamp went out, so go buy some more. Yet don't work. Okay. And it's, you know, people try to twist this and use this to prove that there will be some Christians left at the split rapture and stuff like this because they didn't have the oil in them and whatever. You know, you don't have oil in you, okay? Sorry. Although you can have, you can eat stuff with olive oil, but you don't have like a little dipstick or something you got to pull out and see how much Holy Spirit oil you have. Nonsense. John chapter 2. John chapter 2. John chapter 2 verse 1. And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there, and both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And then they go and they don't have any wine, and Jesus turns water into wine. That was the first miracle that he did publicly. But you see there again, marriage, there was a ceremony involved. And I'm not going to get into the whole Jewish marriage thing. It's interesting to study out. But the point is, it wasn't just some guy said, hey, I like you over there, you know, and I'm just going to take you. We're going to go into the tent here and we're going to, you know, get into the marriage bed and consummate the marriage. No, there was more involved. Okay. And I'm sure if you would study the thing out, it's not doesn't say it in context there, but there was probably, these two were probably betrothed. I can say with almost all certainty that they were betrothed before that actual feast there, this party that they had, and they have kind of the ceremony, you know, whatever was done, whatever was said, and then they go and they know each other, and then that's the marriage. But it isn't just flesh joining flesh. Um, Revelation 19 This is going to be the marriage I was talking about earlier, where the Bride of Christ gets married. Revelation 19, uh, verse 7 through 9. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. So is there a marriage going to come up in heaven? Yes. You say, explain that whole thing. Why is it that he sees a woman? I don't know. I have no idea. You know, I talked about that in my sermon on marriage and the resurrection. And in the resurrection were males. Basically male angels. So why does he see a woman there? that would somehow represent the church. And you go into it later, and it's a, the woman is described as a city. So, interesting. Maybe how the, all the saints together in the city with their white robes on, maybe it somehow looks kind of like a woman or something. I don't know. Okay, there's a lot of that stuff I just don't understand. But I believe it. I don't have to understand everything. I just have to believe. Okay? The book of Revelation is not really that hard to understand. It's it's actually harder to believe. That's the problem. Most people, their intellect gets in the way. You know, They don't want to, well, I believe in this and that because then they get made fun of in the world. Well, you got to get to a point where you don't care what the world thinks about you. 
if you're concerned with the world making fun of you, you're not going to amount to much as a Christian. But, uh, so you see the thing there, another one of the traditions that's passed down through the centuries, and it actually goes right back to the Bible, first we saw that a woman was veiled, then we saw that the father is the one that's putting on the marriage feast and you know ceremony, whatever's going on there. Now we see that she's arrayed in white, a white garment. So you have the white wedding dress that the woman wears when she gets married. All right, very interesting. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. What would be the purpose then in marriage in the New Testament? You know, have things really changed since Adam and Eve were created? 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Hopefully it doesn't start raining here. It's getting kind of dark, but we'll see. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. Now concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Let the hus husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband, and likewise also the husband hath not power of his, his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. But I speak this by permission and not of commandment. For I would that all men were even as I myself, but every man hath his proper gift of God, one after this manner and another after that. I say therefore to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them, to, for, for them if they abide even as I, Paul was single. But if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. So, the Bible's very uh, clear here what one of the purposes of marriage is. If you are having problems with lust, then you better get married. Because then you have a relationship that you don't have to feel ashamed of being naked with your wife. And there's the marriage bed there that you come together. And you can help each other fulfill that need. I'm trying to just say it as, without being too crude here. But that's what's going on there. Perfectly fine. Not a problem. You don't come together and say flesh joining flesh and nothing more. And we're just going to kind of work this thing out. That's whoremongering. Okay. And we're going to see in a little bit what, you know, the definition of adultery. We're going to see that. And, and marrying somebody that is, you know, living in adultery and then you're messed up too. That's not what's going on here. This is two people that are not married to anybody else and they're living together as husband and wife doing whatever ceremony goes along with their culture as long as it doesn't make you go into sin or something like that. That's what I would recommend. You know. And I think that those elements of the marriage that you see there in the Bible of a veil I think is fine to have in a wedding. I think a, the wife should be wearing a, a, a white gown. I think that there should be some kind of a ceremony there that the parents put on to give away their daughter. You know, I think that that's all good. And I think too, and here's the one that's controversial, I think too that there should be betrothal. I don't think Christians should get engaged. I think that they should be betrothed. And when you are betrothed, you're as good as being married. When you make the commitment to say, so-and-so, will you marry me? You are officially married. There's no, well, if this thing doesn't work out, you know, we'll just cut it, you know, just break it off or something. No, uh-uh. I know when I asked my wife, uh, you know, will you marry me? It was like, there was no thought in my mind of, well, if it doesn't work, I'm just going to forget it. Here's a big airplane. You know, when I made that decision, when I prayed about it and I, I saw the Lord saying, yeah, you know, she's the one, go ahead, you know, and I examined and, and, and you know, my, her beliefs and, and we talked about things. Yeah, that's, that's a problem. A lot of these, you know, young couples, they go out and they do fun things and they never talk about beliefs. They never talk about things. And, they, and when they do, they hear, oh, she believes this way, but, 
oh, I just love her, and you know, that'll change after we get married. No, it won't. You put the Lord first in your relationship. If you meet somebody and they don't line up with the Bible and you see that they're not going to change, don't marry them. Don't become betrothed to them. Don't say, well, I'm going to have to ask this person to marry me so then they'll be more serious about our relationship or something. No. If they're not serious right up front and wanting to talk about the Bible and you don't feel that spiritual tie there, then don't ask them to get married. And don't say, well, I'll ask her to get to marry me, but if I find out things are worse, then I'll just break off the engagement. Don't do that. That's not right, according to Scripture. We should be practicing betrothal. All right? And by the way, if you're a Christian out there and you a Christian guy and you like a girl that's engaged to another man, don't mess with her. She's another man's espoused wife. Better think about that, too. Don't say, well, she's not actually married yet, so I can maybe get in there and bust that relationship up and I can get her to be interested in me. Instead, uh-uh. If she's engaged, hands off. Don't mess with it. And by the way, if you say, well, I'm just going to anyhow, I don't care what you have to say, Brian. Okay, then you're going to be founding your marriage upon very shaky grounds. And if you do that with her and bust up her betrothal, what's to say she isn't going to later on bust up your marriage? You better be careful. Do it God's way. Okay, so we see there the purpose of New Testament marriage is for companionship, but also if you're having struggles with lust, then, you know, come together and, and be married to avoid fornication. But I want to say something else here in uh, verse 7, or well, verse 6, but I speak this by permission and not of commandment. Okay, what Paul's saying there is, he's, if he would say, now this is another commandment of the Lord, that you'd be better off staying single. We'll see then the celibate, the whole celibacy thing, the whole argument there, then they would be able to use that. Paul's just saying, me as a single guy, I can speak from experience and say you're better off to stay single. But if you can't contain, then you better get married. That's all that's going on there. Now what about divorce? Okay, we've established what is biblical marriage. All right, biblical marriage is you wait on the Lord. You know, I waited for 36 years before I found the kind of woman that would help me in, in the ministry. And I praise God that the Lord did not give me some of the women I've dated in my past. I praise the Lord that he didn't give me those women to be my wife. You know, it takes a long time. Sometimes, sometimes, you, you know, the Lord blesses you early on, whatever. But if you're just with somebody and you say, oh, we don't really talk about spiritual things, but we sure have fun together, your marriage isn't going to go too far. You know, and you say, well, then I can get divorced. Well, we're going to talk about that now. But biblical marriage is betrothal and then a ceremony, whatever your cultural ceremony is, and then marriage bed, and then the two of you live together as husband and wife. And you stay together. And you don't get divorced. But what about divorce? Okay? Because I know there are people going, but what about divorce? What if you get divorced? What if, you know... I know you're saying that, so let's continue and see what the Bible says. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 10 through 11. And unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband. But and if she depart, let her remain unmarried, or be reconciled to her, her husband, and let not the husband put away his wife. Okay? You're not supposed to get divorced. It's a command. He doesn't say, I suggest, I recommend. He says, I command. Divorce is wrong. Verse 12. He said, but what if, what if I got married back when I was lost, and then I got saved, and, and I'm saved, but my husband or my wife is not saved? What about that? Verse 12. But to the rest speak I, not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. And the woman which hath an husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. 
for the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God hath called us to peace. For what knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband? Or how knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? But as God hath distributed to every man, as the Lord hath called every one, so let him walk, and so ordain I in all churches. So, if you're married to somebody that's lost, and you get along fine, and they don't cause you to con compromise your convictions, stay married to them. Okay? But if they're causing you to sin, and they're dragging you down to the point where it's affecting your relationship with the Lord, you can't live according to the Bible, then you can divorce them. You say, well, then it's God's will to divorce. No, it's still not God's will. You're still commanded to try and work things out. Marriage is not just this little flippant thing that people have turned it into nowadays. You know, 50% of marriages are ending in divorce. That's not God's will. God is never for divorce. I'll tell you that. Read it the whole way through Scripture. And we're going to see here in a little bit, all divorce will cause you to go through some serious pain. Even if you are justified. Right? And there are causes for you to divorce. Even as Christians. Two Christians. There are causes for divorce. Scriptural causes. But it's still not God's will. Okay? You say, well then how, how could it not be God's will but He allows it? Well, because sin... You know, you should have waited on the Lord for your first marriage instead of rushing out and getting married to the wrong person and whatever else. But I can understand the thing of you get married when you're lost and then you get saved and then your husband or wife, whatever, whichever of the two you are, you know, they don't want to get saved and they start to attack you for your faith that you have. Well, you're not under bondage in such cases. God does not look down at that marriage as a legally binding thing. He says, okay, I understand you made a mistake there. You know, you got married when you were lost. Now what are you going to do about it? Well, get divorced. You're not under bondage in that case. If you cannot reconcile it, if they want nothing to do with salvation, there's no chance at all that they're ever going to get saved, they make that plain to you, okay, then get divorced. You know, especially if you're a woman and your husband's beating on you or something like that or going out getting drunk and things, doesn't want anything to do with you. Okay, divorce him. That's what the Bible teaches. But what are the scriptural grounds for divorce? Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 22. Deuteronomy 22. We're going to see here later that Jesus Christ actually refers back to this in the New Testament. Deuteronomy 22, verse 13. It says, If any man take a wife and go in unto her and hate her. Okay, going in unto her means that they have consummated the marriage bed. Okay, and he hates her. And give occasions of speech against her, and bring up an evil name upon her, and say, I took this woman, and when I came to her, I found her not a maid. In other words, she was not a virgin. Then shall the father of the damsel and her mother take and bring forth the tokens of the damsel's virginity unto the elders of the city in the gate. And the damsel's father shall say unto the elders, I gave my daughter unto this man to wife, and he hateth her. And lo, he hath given occasions of speech against her, saying, I found not thy daughter a maid, and yet these are the tokens of my daughter's virginity. And they shall spread the cloth before the elders of the city, and the elders of that city shall take that man and chastise him. And they shall immerse him in an hundred shekels of silver, and give them unto the father of the damsel, because he hath brought up an evil name upon a virgin of Israel, and she shall be his wife. He may not put her away all his days. You see? He says, hey, this, you know, I don't think that this girl's a virgin. She was a whore. She was a harlot. You know? And it wasn't true. Because for some reason or another, he just, you know, 
didn't marry her, didn't think things out, and he marries her, and then he actually, you know, consummates the marriage, the physical union, and then he says, I don't, I think I changed my mind. No, it doesn't work. And he's actually chastised, you know, and then has to pay a fine. Okay, but uh, verse 20, But if this thing be true, and the tokens of virginity be not found for the damsel, then they shall bring out the damsel to the door of her father's house, and the men of her city shall stone her with stones that she die, because she hath wrought folly in Israel to play the whore in her father's house, so shalt thou put evil away from among you. So a woman back then, if she was not a virgin, when she got married and her husband said, hey, wait a second here, she lied to me. She said she was, and now I found out she wasn't. She could actually be stoned to death for that. So you see that thing there that if he's betrothed to this girl and when they consummate the marriage, he finds that out, it's actually death penalty for the young woman. But what about a writing of divorcement? Deuteronomy chapter 24. A bill of divorcement. Deuteronomy 24 verse 1. When a man hath taken a wife and married her, and it come to pass that she find no favor in his eyes, because he hath found some uncleanness in her, then let him write her a bill of divorcement, and give it in her hand, and send her out of his house. And when she is departed out of his house, she may go and be another man's wife. Now see, this isn't quite the same thing as what we just read back there in chapter 22. It's not that he discovers she's not a virgin and, and you know, and then she's taken out in stone. Uh-uh. There's something else to this. He finds some uncleanness in her. And he says, I don't want this woman anymore. He writes her a bill of divorcement. Now she's free to leave and get married. Verse 3, And if the latter husband hate her, and write her a bill of divorcement, and giveth it in her hand, and sendeth her out of his house, or if the latter husband die, which took her to be his wife, her former husband, which sent her away, may not take her again to be his wife, after that she is defiled, for that is abomination before the Lord. And thou shalt not cause the land to sin, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. So, what's going on there? Well, the first husband says, I don't like this woman. He finds some kind of uncleanness in her that he doesn't like, and he says, get out. Here's your bill of divorcement. We're divorced. She goes out and she marries another man. That man, I guess, finds the same thing and says, I don't want you either. She can't go back at that point in time. She can't go back to her first husband. And if the second husband dies, she still can't go back to the first husband. Okay? So you see there is a thing of a bill of divorcement there. Matthew chapter 5. You say, okay, what, what's the thing for today? Matthew chapter 5. You see, because Matthew 5 is actually doctrinally in the Old Testament. And what you have here is you actually have no real, well, we'll see about the instructions for divorce and remarriage in the New Testament for a New Testament Christian, but this thing carries in here. It's still doctrinally in the Old Testament when Jesus Christ shows up on the earth, and you're going to see what he does about this law in the Old Testament. Matthew 5, verse 31. Okay, it says here, It hath been said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. Okay, what's Jesus referring to? He's referring to Deuteronomy chapter 24. Okay, but look at verse 32. But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery, and whosoever shall marry her that is divorced committeth adultery. So it's no longer just some uncleanness that you find in her. No, now it's fornication. If you come home and you find out your wife is in bed with another man, that's scriptural grounds for divorce. Okay? You find out that she's been running around and you confirm it, that she has definitely cheated on you, or vice versa. This works both ways. The wife finds out that her husband is out committing fornication with another woman or women. 
then you have scriptural grounds for divorce. But you can't look at your husband or wife and say, I don't like you. I don't like the way you laugh or I don't like the way you don't put the toilet seat down or something stupid like that, you know, or I don't like the way you spend money or whatever. Those are things you should have figured out before you got married to them. And there's a lot of people right now that are getting divorced and remarried among the body of Christ. and They don't have scriptural grounds. They're doing it thinking, well, you know, I'm divorced and legally and stuff, you know, I'm all divorced. And yet there was never fornication. See, that's sin. That is not justified in the Lord's sight. And, you know, I've heard people say, well, uh, uh, desertion is also scriptural grounds for divorce. Where does it say that in the Bible? Now, if your wife leaves you and she's going living with another man, well, one plus one equals two, you know. I mean, you can probably figure that they're not sleeping in separate bedrooms, you know. But if she just leaves you and she's going and living with family or something someplace else, you don't have scriptural grounds for divorce. I'm sorry, I don't believe that. And another thing is they say, well, if I heard of a, a preacher the one time that was married to a woman and, and she wasn't, you know, coming into the marriage bed, you know, doing her part there, so he divorced her. And you say, you know, well, then was that okay? No, I don't believe it was. I don't believe it was. I don't believe that that is scriptural grounds for divorce. You say, well, what was the brother supposed to do? I mean, she wasn't, she wasn't obeying 1 Corinthians chapter 7. She was withholding her body from her husband. What was he supposed to do? Uh, here's a thought. Figure that stuff out before you get married. You know? Don't sin and then blame God because of your mistake that you made in your past. Don't, you know, if you're talking to a woman and you're saying, you know, this is the woman that you're going to get married to, get that stuff talked out. Be grown up about it, you know, and just say, I don't want to elicit any kind of, any kind of, uh, um, lust issues here but we need to talk about some things is the marriage bed going to be a problem for you is fulfilling your part of the deal here is that going to be an issue and if they're like I don't want to talk about that I don't want to talk about that you better get that stuff talked out I'm not saying you have to talk out all the gory details or anything of what you're going to do after you're married you don't have to do that but what I'm saying is you better have that thing talked out and if you make the mistake man out there because it's usually the men it's usually that angle you make the mistake of marrying an ice cube and she won't let you touch her that's your fault you should have known that beforehand and i'm not saying you go out and you look for a harlot on the street corner or something like that no but you you need to talk that stuff over with your wife and just say we need to have that as a healthy relationship there are times I'm going to have needs. There are going to be times you will have needs. And I might not be in the mood or whatever, but hey, that's part of the biblical marriage bed. Okay? That stuff is there. And you say, well, Brian, you shouldn't be talking about this stuff in front of single people. Quite on the contrary. This stuff isn't talked about enough in front of single people. You don't have to get into all the details and have these sex seminars that they have at these big modern mega churches. I think that stuff is a wicked abomination. But what you do have to discuss is, if you are single, you need to be very, very, very careful before you say, will you marry me to someone? Or if you're a woman, you say, yes, I will marry you. You better be very careful. You better make sure that there aren't problems there that are going to manifest themselves later. Don't ever fall for the deception that they will change after we get married. Not going to happen. Nine times out of ten, it is not going to happen. The person that you're dating, you know, or courting, if whatever you want to say there, the person that you are with, that you're discussing and possibly thinking marriage with, most of what they are is not going to change. You need to get that thing figured out. And if you don't, and then you get married, and then later on you want to get divorced because your wife is not doing her part or your husband is not doing his part, well, that's your problem. And if you get divorced, you're going to have a horrible life. And I know of Christian couples that have gotten divorced without scriptural grounds, and their life pretty much falls apart from then on. Continuing on, Matthew chapter 19.
Matthew 19, verse 1 through 12. Okay, And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these sayings, he departed from Galilee and came into the coasts of Judea beyond Jordan. And great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Remember back in the Old Testament? Jesus has already spoken in Matthew chapter 5, saying, But now I say unto you, that it's only fornication. It's not just any uncleanness, it's now just fornication. Jesus actually makes it a little bit more difficult now to get a scriptural divorce. Verse 4, And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh? Wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh. Sorry about that, big bird just flew over. Um, what therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. You better be careful about divorce. They say unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? Check this out, verse 8. He saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. You know the reason for divorce? The love of self. When you, stop to lo when you stop having charity in marriage, charity is the bond of perfectness, and you start to think about yourself more so than your husband or your wife, whichever you are, that's when divorce happens. It's always based on sin. Always. And so this thing of the Lord giving a, a ability to divorce there, it's because of the hardness of your hearts. It's not because God wants that. But continuing, verse 9, And I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery. His disciples say unto him, If the case of the man be so with his wife, it is not good to marry. But he said unto them, All men cannot receive this saying, save they to whom it is given. For there are some eunuchs which were so born from their mother's womb, and there are some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men, and there be eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sakes. sake. He that is able to receive it, let him receive it. Eunuch there being a reference to a single man. Okay. So the whole point is that, you know, yes, you can get divorced. Yes, you can have a divorce because your partner has committed fornication. But it's not God's will. It's never His will for you, get, for you to get a divorce. Okay? Romans chapter 7. You say, okay, I see that there is a scriptural grounds for divorce. What about remarriage? Oh boy. Got some thunder coming in here. Saying 50% chance of thunderstorms today. I think we're uh, heading towards the better or the more positive aspect of that 50%. Romans chapter 7, verses 1 through 3. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. So, obviously here, if the woman is married to a man and he commits fornication, well, scripturally she can leave him. And we're going to see later that she can remarry, okay, based on scriptural divorce. But the real uh, scriptural grounds for remarriage is death. And I'm going to show you why I say that later on. I'm going to show you that even though there are scriptural grounds based on fornication and remarriage is allowed, there's trouble associated with it. But if your husband dies and you're a woman, or if your wife dies and you're a man, well, then you can get married and no problem. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 27.
Oh boy. First Corinthians chapter seven, verse twenty seven. Art thou bound unto a wife? You know? Bound? Yeah, legally married to some to a wife. Art thou bound unto a wife? Seek not to be loosed. Work it out, in other words. Art thou loosed from a wife? Now that doesn't mean a single person. You know, back when I was single, I was never loosed from a wife. You have to have had a wife before you can be loosed from a wife. Okay? This is saying, are you scripturally divorced? Seek not a wife, but, and if thou marry, thou hast not sinned. And if a virgin marry, she hath not sinned. Now look at this. Nevertheless, such shall have trouble in the flesh, but I spare you. Now do you have trouble in the flesh if your husband or wife has died and you get remarried? No. What's this talking about in context? It's talking about somebody who their partner committed fornication, they get scripturally divorced, and now they're loose from a wife, but now they've gotten married again. Guess what? You will have trouble in the flesh. You know why? Everywhere you go, it's going to be a bad testimony. Oh, are these your kids? Well, yes, this is my son to my first marriage, and these two others are my kids to my second marriage. Bad testimony. Uh, how did that divorce proceeding go? I know a, a guy that got divorced here a year or so ago, and it ended up costing him, I think, $15,000 for court costs. How does that work out for you? And by the way, he wasn't scripturally divorced. His wife never committed fornication on him. They just split up because of mutual hatred. That's not biblical grounds for divorce. Not at all. But even if you have scriptural grounds and you divorce and you get remarried, you're going to have trouble in the flesh. Don't tell me that you won't. You know? There's always going to be that thing there of this woman is not my first wife. That's always going to be there for the rest of your days. And I'm going to say this, and some of you are probably going to get mad at me, I don't believe God can bless you and use you the way that He would have wanted to had you been married one time. I didn't say that you're not qualified for ministry. I didn't say somebody who's divorced and remarried can't ever minister for the Lord. I didn't say that. What I'm saying is, it's a very, very, very serious sin, a very serious mistake. But let's finish up here. It's starting to rain. Verse 39. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 39. The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth, but if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will, only in the Lord. Don't be stupid and, make, and go and get married to somebody who's lost. Make sure it's in the Lord when you get married. But she is happier if she so abide after my judgment, and I think also that I have the Spirit of God. Paul is saying, in other words, if, you, if your husband or your wife dies, stay single, serve the Lord, you know, but if you want to get married, go ahead, you know. So, what do we see? We see that when you go to make the decision, even, even your betrothal should be a very, very serious decision. You should not make the mistake of just flippantly going, Oh, will you marry me and I can back out? Uh-uh. That should be a very serious thing. Marriage, there's a ceremony involved. It's not just flesh joining flesh. But when flesh has joined flesh when the marriage bed has been consummated and then one of the members of that flesh that that's now twain or one when one of the members of that flesh joins their body with another flesh now you have scriptural grounds for divorce and you can get divorced but you will have trouble so that's going to be it we're not going to close with prayer today because i don't want to get struck by lightning <laughs> i think the lord will protect me but you know it's not so much that as i don't want my bible and notes getting soaked here it's starting to rain. We're going to have to get in. So thank you very much for watching. And uh, just um, we'll see you next week. That's it.